Welcome, everyone, and thank you for joining ACMRS for The Bard in the Borderlands. I'm Jeff Way, the manager of publishing futures for ACMRS. First, I once again want to extend a thanks to the ASU's Institute for Humanities Research for their generous funding of many of our 2020 2021 digital events. And looking ahead, I hope you'll join us for our next event on March 17th, Upstream, a conversation between two early career scholars of color featuring our 2020-2021 ACMRS short-term residents, Letha Chien and Mira Kafantaris, and for Race Before Race Politics later this spring. You can find information about upcoming ACMRS events on our website, and be sure to sign up for our mailing list to get updates on future events and opportunities at acmrs.asu.edu slash about, if you haven't done so already. And if you would like to help in supporting more events like these, please consider going to acmrs.asu.edu slash give to make a donation if you're able to do so. Today's roundtable will be a conversation among five scholars working on the cutting edge of Shakespeare borderland studies. Ruben Espinosa, Catherine Gillen, Jesus Montano, Adriana M. Santos, and Catherine Romero Santos. As always, given our speakers' extensive lists of accomplishments, I won't be reading their bios today, but they are available on our website and I encourage you to find them there. Uh, today's event will unfortunately not be live captioned, um, but you can still follow along uh, through the talk and we will have the talk up on YouTube later with captions. So, um, and then throughout today's event, you can also pose questions through the Q&A button at any point throughout the conversation. So please, if you have one, feel free to drop it there. Um, and as always, we of course encourage live tweeting today's event using the ACMRS events hashtag. Now, for a bit more context and introduction to the structure of today's event, I'm excited to turn things over to Catherine Romero Santos. Thanks so much, Jeff. I would like to begin by thanking you for having the vision to adopt an earlier iteration of this event, which was planned to take place at Trinity University in March 2020 as part of a public humanities program sponsored by the Trinity Humanities Collective. We are grateful to you, Ayanna Thompson, Leah Newsom, and the ACMRS staff for giving us the platform and the support to reimagine this as something even more public and the launch of much larger initiatives. As we look toward a robust future for scholars, teachers, students, artists, and activists invested in the concerns of the US-Mexico borderlands, we wish to outline some of the emerging trends and contours shaping the developing field of Borderlands Shakespeare, which encompasses both cultural phenomena and lines of inquiry that, as Adriana Santos and Catherine Gillen have put it, quote, generate new and provocative insights, not just about the region, but about Shakespeare, close quote. It is a field that has emerged at the intersection of several disciplines and ways of knowing, and therefore requires interdisciplinary cross-historical, and regionally specific approaches to understand. It builds on ongoing conversations about Shakespeare, race, coloniality, and pedagogy. It draws on the fields of adaptation, appropriation, and translation studies, among many others. And it is deeply invested in the methodologies and epistemologies of Chicanx and indigenous studies. The hour we will spend together today is only the beginning of what we hope will be a much longer and much broader conversation. In the spirit of community and conversation, we have decided to experiment with the traditional format of the roundtable. Rather than giving pre prepared remarks in succession, we will ask one another a series of questions based on our shared interests and recently published or forthcoming work. We will then open things up to Q&A. If you have further questions, please feel free to email us at borderlandshakespeare at gmail.com. I will put that email address in the chat. We would love to hear from you. In many ways, this gathering of scholars and teachers interested in the topic of Borderland Shakespeare is a continuation of a symposium that Kate and Adriana co-organized at Texas A&M University San Antonio in 2018. So my first question is for them. Since organizing that wonderful symposium, you've subsequently collaborated on two forthcoming essays and are currently working on a third, this one on wounding and healing in Borderland Shakespeare. Can you tell us about your collaborations? Why do you think it's important for Shakespeare scholars to engage with Chicanx studies? And Adriana, can you tell us about how your expertise as a Chicanx studies scholar informs your understanding of Borderland Shakespeare? Thank you, Katie. Um, first, I'd like to thank you for inviting us here. 
um, to Trinity Humanities, to ACMRS for the support of the event, and to the other scholars on the panel. Thank you so much for being here. Um, I would also like to begin by acknowledging the land that we are on. Um, in San Antonio, uh, the land is deemed the Yanawana, or the life-giving waters of the San Antonio River by the indigenous um, communities who live here, the caretakers of the land. So I'd like to pay respect to them, um, particularly members of the Top Pilam Coyoteca Nation and the Estocna Carizo Come Crudo Nation, as well as many others that reside um, here and in other parts of Texas. So thank you to them. Um, in terms of our collaboration, Kate and I work at Texas A&M San Antonio, uh, which is situated near the Mission Espada. Um, so it's part of a chain of five missions here in um, the San Antonio area. And as collaborators, we've pledged to um, learn about these communities, to pay respect to um, to the ancestry, to the history of this land, um, to work with and in solidarity with local communities um, and social justice movements. So this was the context in which we began our collaboration and which we um, put together the symposium. So Kate, would you like to talk about the symposium? Sure, thank you everyone. Yeah, the symposium was a really fantastic and fun and interactive event. We conceived of it as very community based. And so we invited theater practitioners, local high school teachers, community college teachers, faculty from surrounding institutions, as well as students and just members of the general community. Um, it was really exciting. We wanted to bring together scholarly conversations with conversations happening around pedagogy and theater. And we also had students actually perform. Um, they performed um, Josh Innocencio's short play Ophelia, which reimagines Ophelia as a queer Latino sexual assault survivor. And um, Josh actually joined us, which was really fantastic. Um, and from there, really, Adriana and I really began our collaborative inquiry into this topic of um, Borderland Shakespeare. Uh, yes, yeah, so it was really a wonderful event because it represented, as Kate said, so many different groups of people who are interested in this intersection between um, Chicanx studies and Shakespeare studies. Um, so my area of expertise is actually Chicana OX studies. Um, and this field was really born from activism of the 60s. Uh, it, centers indigenous ways of knowing, um, Mexican American histories, culture. Um, it celebrates uh, the self-representation of these communities, but also looks at tough social justice issues and um, interlocking systems of oppression, like race, class, and gender. Um, so it's really important that we sort of bring that to our analysis of uh, Shakespeare studies and of what these productions are, are trying to do in terms of bringing um, Shakespeare and its relevance to Chicanx communities. Um, Texas A&M San Antonio is an HSI. We are about 70% first generation uh, Latinx students. So um, it was really important for us in our specific um, region in our, our area to look at this. But then we began to really think about the broader implications for um, other Borderlands productions as well. Yeah, and just to wrap up, I wanted to note that we really see our collaboration in terms of uh, feminist kind of collaboration. And we draw on Chicana feminism in particularly as we imagine that. And so we're really seeking to kind of disrupt some of the ideas of the single solitary, often male, often white genius that can be still prevalent in Shakespeare studies, <laughs> perhaps more than in other fields. And so we really want to kind of disrupt that. And I also will say as a white Shakespearean, I just think it's so so important for us when we're engaging in um, kind of appropriation work, right, Shakespeare appropriation, that we really think about the kind of racial, colonial, cultural contexts into which we're kind of delving, you know, when we do that. And so I've benefited immensely from Adriana's expertise in, Ch in Chicanx studies. Thank you, Kate. Um, so to move on, I'd like to address a question to Ruben. 
Ruben, your work is a model for bringing Chicanx studies to bear on Shakespeare. Uh, in your essays, Stranger Shakespeare and Beyond the Tempest, Language, Legitimacy, and La Frontera, you write about the role Shakespeare has played in educational and language policies and practices affecting border residents, particularly Chicanexes. How do you see Shakespeare invoked in relation to these issues, which have long histories in the region? How do, you, um, how do these histories affect the way you teach Shakespeare? Thank you, Adriana. Um, first of all, it's great to be sharing this space with you and with uh, the other panel. So I uh, just want to echo uh, the, the thanks to ACMRS and everybody involved in, in putting this together. Um, so yeah, without, without belaboring this too much, I think the, the most um, obvious focal point for me in terms of, of actual lived experiences where Shakespeare is concerned is, was a situation um, just south of Phoenix, actually in a Tucson Independent School District. Uh, with the book banning controversy, which, which I have written about and, and thought about at length. And uh, to me, that, that shows the invocation of Shakespeare, I think, in ways that, that much too often happens, right? Um, I won't, I, because of time, I won't give the whole backstory. You all can, can uh, read about this. It's, 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 it's been well documented. But um, when Dolores Huerta you know, it, um, provoked students and, and had them think about their, their voices, right? The pushback against that uh, from the district and the superintendent in particular was the foreclosing on the Mexican American Studies program. And in that moment, what you have then is attention drawn to the oppression of brown voices, right? And I feel, I, I firmly believe that the reason this, this was such a controversy was because Shakespeare was implicated in that. When, when the teachers came together and put a list of the books together that was famously the banned books list, right? They weren't actually banned, but they kind of you know, were, were self-censoring so that they wouldn't have to pay heavy fines, uh, these, these high school teachers. Uh, you, ha you have names like Martina Espada, you have names like James Baldwin, Lorian Saldua, Rudolfo Anaya. I, I feel like there is enough you know, merit to these particular authors and voices that it should have been a controversy, but what everybody was focused on was the fact that you know, Shakespeare's The Tempest was one of the books that was part of this Mexican American studies program, right? And so suddenly I think Shakespeare's social capital is, is being mobilized then uh, on the side of those advocating for the Mexican American studies program because they recognize very quickly this is getting national attention because Shakespeare is one of those voices. What we can glean from that outside of this is, is you know, the fact that it, it is the value of this white male iconic author, right? That is important to people who think that that should be part of the education system in general, right? And so in this way, I think, you know, we can, we can think about his value, right? We can, we can uh, create conversations in the classroom, right? And, and this is where I invite my students to, to is using that, that particular uh, controversy to ask students, you know, to question why, right? Why Shakespeare? Like, what is it about Shakespeare that is deemed more important than, and it's an opportunity then to you know, look outward and to think about the way that, that you know, these issues of language, these issues of whiteness, right, are, are often, uh, much too often deployed and, and, and taken as a given in the classroom, right? You know, we, we don't question why we are studying particular authors and not others. And that's an opportunity, I think, to have those important conversations in the classroom as students begin to, you know, like you all, I, I work at a Hispanic serving institution, uh, we, we have an 80%, you know, Latinx uh, uh, student demographic here. And in that regard, you know, to really get these students to think about what is it they are asked, being asked to consume in their classes here, right? Well, and not just in the college classroom, but to think back to their high school experiences. And, and it typically is an almost all white male dominated field through English, right? Um, and so it's not, I mean, this is all to say, it's not really about Shakespeare at the end of the day, right? It, it's about, I think, marginalizing certain voices, marginalizing certain people. And again, with the Mexican American Studies program, right? To think of introducing students to Ansaldúa at the high school level, to think of introducing students to Rodolfo Anaya at the high school level, I, I think this could have profound implications for a sense of confidence in, in oneself and voice in, in, in questioning here, right? Uh, these paradigms that elevate whiteness above, above everything else. And so that might not necessarily be unique to the borderlands, but given our place in the borderlands, given uh, the, the, the predominance of, of Latinx is here, right? Uh, I think it becomes incredibly important for them to really focus and capitalize 
on on that self confidence right as we move forward and so this is just a one of several ways i'm going to i'm going to saw myself there for the sake of time here right but um it, i think uh, these conversations are important to have and uh, quite frankly, I think these concerns about education resonate um, in many ways with the work that Jesus has been doing. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna turn attention to Jesus now. Um, so Jesus, as, as someone who specializes in children's and, and young adult literature, how does the complicated role of Shakespeare in American education systems affect students in the borderlands, particularly BIPOC students? Now, maybe you can tell us a little bit about the book that you're writing entitled Young Latinx Shakespeare's race, justice, and literary appropriation, and how this work might be engaged in the K through 12 classrooms. Well, first of all, thank you, Ruth. Um, so I'll answer the first question, uh, which I think segues from what you said, which is that, uh, to be honest with you, uh, when I began this project, uh, I was really hesitant. Uh, there were a couple of hesitancy. I think one was personal and one was professional. Uh, the professional part was like, you know, did I wanna, did I wanna engage with Shakespeare? Uh, you're engaging with the, the epitome of whiteness. Uh, you know, I, I, do, I, do I go into that or do I do other, other forms of scholarship which are just as pressing in my field uh, and stuff in, in, uh, in Latinx uh, young adult uh, literature. And so I, I went into it with uh, hesitancy uh, and mostly because I really didn't see how Latinx young adult literature and Shakespeare fit. I, I just didn't see it at the beginning. And I think that's where the personal comes in that um, when I was in high school, uh, we were, I read four Shakespeare plays and I went to the Tempest at the Globe. So there's not the real Globe, by the way. Odessa, Texas has a uh, facsimile, I think, is the best way to say it, uh, approximation of the Globe. And so for extra credit, I actually went to go see a Tempest. So that's actually five Shakespeare works. And so, you know, you're like, okay, so that's that's not so bad. And I, I'm actually thankful that I, that I actually was able to read quite a bit because I love reading. At the same time, I think this is what you're pointing out to, uh, Ruben, is that um, the, the role of Shakespeare in the American education system is complicated. Uh, as an agent of assimilation, I mean, you know, you're, you're given certain things uh, and you're not given other things. So you could say like, you're the agent of assimilation, which would be not an issue I said, or quite frankly, I'd lean sometimes to, to the uh, agent of cultural genocide. And the reason I say cultural genocide is because as you're pointing out, um, at the same time I was reading all these Shakespeare plays and reading all these other classics and stuff like that, there were no Latinx or Chicanx texts or authors in our curriculum at all. And so in many ways it was, it was, it was uh, I was given Shakespeare but nothing else to, to place alongside of it. And so when I began my, my work, I was like, okay, so what do I do now? Where do I, where do I inter, inter, you know, interject myself into this conversation and stuff like that? And so what I would like us to consider as we invoke uh, Borderlands Shakespeare so Latinx young adult literature informs Shakespeare, so that's one part, and the other part is how Shakespeare informs Latinx artistic and cultural production. And so I'll say it again because uh, I think it's worth saying is how Latinx young adult literature informs Shakespeare and how Shakespeare informs Latinx artistic and cultural production. At play, I think, is Gloria Saldúa's statement that border artistas cambian el punto de referencia. So what she's saying is a border artist change the point of reference. And I'm quoting here. By disrupting the neat separation between cultures, they create a cultural mix, una mestizada in their artwork, end quote. Latinx YA appropriation of Shakespeare, I argue, are literary mestizadas. They provide not only cultural representations and literary mirrors for young readers, they are likewise a new reckoning for Shakespeare in which his works are reimagined from and reconfigured within Latinx culture. And so to give you an example, some of the texts I'm working with. So in one of them, one of the texts that I'm working with asked me to consider in which way Romeo and Juliet can fund discussions on racial colorism, racial colorism, the lasting legacy of colonialism and racism in Latinx communities, which where, where racial colorism is ex not only exists, but exists uh, quite strongly. One novel asked me to contemplate what it would mean if Romeo were signed a girl at birth. Uh, for other works, the patriarchal imperative in Hamlet, for example, to enact revenge uh, in worlds where violence, police brutality, and social justice meet are the topic. And so uh, quite, a few, quite a range of texts that, I, that I'm working with. All of them, I would say, are literary mestizadas. From the critical lens of literary mestizadas, what emerges, therefore, 
is a possibility to recast Shakespeare's role from the architect of oppression, as Baldwin said, uh, to an important component, if mixed thoroughly, for young readers to engage with Shakespeare while simultaneously investing themselves in issues and topics central to their lives and experiences. And that's, so that becomes a cultural mestizada. Uh, so we see the ways in which liter of the literary part funds cultural, uh, cultural ways of being and thinking and stuff like that. So um, one of the things I would say, uh, so in, uh, I'll, I'll start talking for just a second because uh, press for time here. Uh, but I would like to say this because I never said this before, so I kind of want to say it. Que viva Borderlands Shakespeare. Que viva. <laughs> so uh, in any case, uh, I'll stop there. Uh, Katie, you've been thinking about issues of education and public outreach in your essay, uh, Guillermo Shakespeare para Todos, which is forthcoming in Shakespeare Quarterly. You write about the role that Borderlands Shakespeare initiatives and productions can and should play in public humanities and outreach projects centered on Shakespeare. I wonder if you could talk more about that. Sure. Thank you, Jesusi. Que viva. Um, all of what everyone's been saying so far uh, really resonates with, with my thinking on this topic uh, and is an extension of the classroom, intersects with the classroom in, in many ways. Um, my, my answer to this question and the work that I've been doing in this article also builds on conversations happening in pre-modern critical race studies. So as I think about the potential of public humanities and public engagement, um, I am drawing on the words of Kim F. Hall and Peter Erickson in the introduction to their special issue of Shakespeare Quarterly on race in 2016, where they say that a strong future for early modern race studies will depend on deeper public engagement. More recently, in her keynote for Race Before Race at the Folder Shakespeare Library, Margot Hendricks says um, that to do pre-modern critical race studies is to be a public humanist. And I think for the reasons that have already been articulated, there is a lot of potential for um, engaging with publics beyond classrooms, beyond the academy when it comes to borderland Shakespeare. But I think that the way forward in that work is in collaboration with members of borderland communities um, and in ways that are accountable to those communities because there's a real risk i think when especially shakespeareans are turning to make shakespeare relevant para todos that um, issues that are steeped in racism or stereotypes might seep into that kind of programming um, so to offer an example of, of the kind of programming that I think is viable and, um, and really exciting, um, I have been in conversation with and I write about the work of a playwright named Bernardo Masson, who is from San Diego. He's from Chula Vista and he, he works in San Diego and he did a bilingual production of Measure for Measure in 2016 that was set in the border and staged in the San Diego Public Library. And rather than having a little bit of Spanish here and there, he was really committed to making this play truly bilingual and translating Shakespeare into Spanish in a way that, as he put it, did justice to Spanish speaking audiences. But more than that, I think what was so cool and interesting about what he did with Shakespeare is that he took a play like Measure for Measure with its fraught sexual and social politics and created scenes of translation that are not there in Shakespeare, but are very much indebted to the ways in which Shakespeare stages translation elsewhere. And he used that moment of linguistic contact and conflict um, to think about racialized power structures and to think about the politics of, of language. And so I think that um, the point, as Ruben just said, is that it's not about Shakespeare, but about using Shakespeare to open up these, these key questions um, is for me the, the true value of what a public humanities um, that is originating from a borderlands perspective and not from the centers of racial and cultural and linguistic power can, can be. Um, so as I think about the, the role of theater, and performance in public humanities. I am influenced by Adriana and Kate's writing about community-based productions. Um, you've written about productions set in the Rio Grande Valley and Santa Fe that engage with local geographies and concerns. Can you talk about the importance of community theaters and projects to Borderland Shakespeare? 
how does this emphasis on the land and specific communities relate to or conflict with borderland Shakespeare's interests in deconstructing national borders and its participation in transnational Latinx theater? Thank you so much for that wonderful question, Katie. I also just wanted to take a minute before answering to remind our audience that if you all have questions for us, feel free to type them into the Q&A box and we will attend to them soon. Um, yeah, I think that's such a great question, Katie. Um, we've written um, especially about a play called Kino and Teresa by James Lujan which is set in um, Santa Fe and Pecos Pueblo. So during the Spanish colonial period, which deals very specifically with that location and dynamics of Spanish colonialism. And that's a really interesting play because in that context, Spanish is very clearly a colonial language and it's being used um, as a form like to enact a cultural genocide of sorts to use um, the term you used Jesus um, against the Pueblo. And then we've also been writing about um, the play um, Ceres Magana's um, The Tragic Corrido of Romeo and Lupe. Both of those plays are Romeo and Juliet appropriations. Um, and in The Tragic Corrido, the characters are very much set in the Rio Grande Valley. And they actually talk a lot about that space. What is it called? Like, is it La Frontera? Is it the Magic Valley? Which is the term that like settler um, agriculture, like corporate agriculture types are using to really sell it as this place of like wonderful bounty, as this like magical place to come and settle and make a lot of money. Or is it the RGV, which is the term that some of them were like Chicano activists in the play use. So they talk about that um, space specifically. And it's really interesting in that play, that play was performed by the FAR Community Theater and FAR is very close to the border itself. And um, they actually, it's very much grounded in that town. And community theater seems really important in that space because it can really, um, the, the work, right, can really speak to the community. So often with Shakespeare, especially, there's an assumption about the kind of audience um, that there might be um, in a Shakespeare production. And I think in community theaters, people can say like, maybe we're not gonna actually cater to like wealthy white donors. Maybe we can really talk to our community. And so I think that these plays really um, off afford, I guess, that kind of opportunity to be creative and imaginative um, and also just really grounded in the issues um, and the people, the communities, right, that um, make up that space. Um, I would also just add that especially with the tragic Corrido, that um, play is very much grounded in the teatro tradition as a good deal of borderland Shakespeare is. So that really originates with the Teatro Campesino, um, which was the theatrical wing of the United Farm Workers Union, and really has that kind of like activist, community-based, also agricultural in the sense that this play is also about like um, it's about water rights, it's about rights to land, it's about labor exploitation, environmental destruction in the valley um, as a result of colonial exploitation. And so it's very much like in that kind of activist tradition, um, which I think finds its um, kind of home, not in, you know, on Broadway, but more in um, more local venues. Yes, thank you, Kate. So just uh, to add to that, um, the land is really, really important and really centered in this production, um, which really invokes the indigenous thought and traditions that are very strong along the US-Mexico borderlands. Um, so this indigenous myth uh, mythology and epistemologies are appearing in these productions. Um, in the tragic Corrido, uh, the land and the love of Romeo and, and Lupe are connected. Um, they draw their strength from the land. Um, they meet at a protest, not a party. Um, they talk about how their land, um, their love is fruitful, like, um, like the borderlands. Um, Gloria Anzaldúa's theorization of the U.S.-Mexico border as, quote, una herida abierta, where the third world grates against the first and bleeds, uh, the lifeblood of two worlds merging to form a third country, a border culture, and quote, very much sort of influences this idea of their love of the um, colonial wounds that could potentially be healed through their love, but then also um, the, the hybridity of the borderlands, also, um, the impossibility of, um, 
of reconciling decolonial or rec reconciling um, these colonial uh, confrontations or challenges with just a love story. So it's a really interesting um, kind of like case study in how Shakespeare can speak to um, Chicanx stories and how Chicanx stories can speak to Shakespeare. Um, and this exploration that we do is also built on other Chicana dramatists who are uh, dramaturgs, um, scholars who are working with adaptations like Shadi Moraga, um, Virginia Grice. Um, and so this is how we're kind of theorizing um, the intersections between Chicanx performance, decolonial performatics um, as uh, theorized by Aldama, um, Sandoval, and uh, Garcia. Yeah, and so on this note, um, I think I'm going to transition to a question for um, Katie and Ruben which also gets at this question of border politics um, and colonialism in this way. Um, as, we've, um, as you both talked about, um, Shakespeare is often invoked to address crises on the border, including the militarization of the border, the war on drugs, the detention of migrants, and family separation. And so I'm wondering if you can talk a bit about what this dynamic looks like, and then also whether Shakespeare is really helpful for understanding these issues. You want to go first, Katie? <laughs> sure. <laughs> um, so yeah, thank you for that that question, Kate. And I do think that this question um, speaks to some of the tensions that we've been drawing out in our in our answers here as we've been thinking together. Um, I've just finished writing an article um, that's forthcoming in Literature Compass on, on the recurring use of Shakespeare in general and Macbeth in particular to tell stories, whether in journalism or in popular media about narco trafficking and the power structures of drug cartels. Um, and what I've observed in the last 20 years or so is a quick um, and recurring desire um, to see Shakespeare and his characters in these contemporary crises. Now, such analogizing is not new. Um, we see this all the time. Things get called Shakespearean all the time. Shakespeare's characters um, are invoked to explain political and social issues. Um, but I think we need to spend more time thinking about the racializing and eff effects and consequences of mapping a play like Macbeth onto the US-Mexico borderlands. If we think about the fact that Shakespeare's play concludes with the English invasion of its supposedly barbarous neighbor to restore order, what kinds of imperial intervention does that plot line justify in the context of these borderlands? Is Shakespeare and all of his attendant white cultural supremacy being used to do more harm than good? Um, in the piece, I go on to show that several Latinx theater artists have demonstrated that it's nevertheless possible um, and, and imperative even to use Macbeth to push back against that colonial narrative. But I think as, as Shakespeareans, um, we need to be paying attention to the ways in which a play like Macbeth is popping up in news articles about El Chapo or in TV shows like Breaking Bad, which are both implicitly and explicitly invested in white Anglo-American supremacy. Yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna dovetail on that. I, I think uh, you know thinking about Macbeth in particular as well, uh, having to do with um, or mapping that that idea onto the violence at the border here, right, is something that from from my perspective with with an assignment that I give to students, I, I've had I've seen them utilize this sometimes in a very facile way to discuss the violence. Uh, the cartel violence, right, especially, you know, 10, 15 years ago at, at its height, right, and to address a particular issue, but also use it in very unique and unexpected ways. And so, you know, while some of these, uh, they do five minute adaptations of, of a scene from Shakespeare, right, and so very often they'll, they'll utilize Macbeth, but one stands out to me in particular, right, where that kind of a uh, actual physical violence and killing is then imagined as linguistic violence, right, in the classroom for students and, and really thinking through their position and alienation within the US 
classroom here as, as Transfronterizos. And hearing the students translate Macbeth, right? I'm thinking of, of, of the final scene in, in one particular video uh, where you know the student is 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 quoting the out out brief candle, right? Apagate, apagate, vela breve. And this is kind of beautiful, you know. It resonates beautifully in terms of the confidence in linguistic identity that one has in Spanish, but that is absent in English, right? He's he's just come out of a situation where you know, somebody rolls their eyes because he can't speak English properly, right? And so in this way, I think, you know, there, there are novel understandings of a play like Macbeth, right, that stem beyond the actual physical violence, that stem beyond just the cartel violence, right, but thinking about, about one's positionality. And, and I think that's where it becomes incredibly interesting to see how Shakespeare is utilized, right? Uh, and so, you know, I, I think about this then in the situation with, with the, the children's detention centers, right? And, and the, the, the migrant detention centers here, uh, some of the makeshift detention centers that, that you know, under the previous administration were set up uh, directly beneath the, the bridge, you know, between El Paso and Juarez. In, in that situation then, right, um, you know, in a piece that I wrote, I, I thought about specifically, you know, Thomas More's speech, right, in, in uh, Sir Thomas More that, that is attributed to Shakespeare, Handy of Shakespeare's, right? And, and the conclusion I, I come to is that we, we, don't, we don't need Shakespeare. And that's, that's something that I will reiterate here. We, we don't need Shakespeare to understand these issues. I, I think the importance is understanding these issues and then questioning why Shakespeare is so often deployed for this. And so um, in a forthcoming essay I have uh, in, for a special collection in Shakespeare Bulletin, I am scrutinizing uh, renditions of the speech by Ian McKellen, you know, who, who's, who's rendered it several times, right? And then the Globe Theater, right? Who put out the, the on, on World Refugee Day, put, put out the, the uh, rendition of that through the voices of different actors and also actual refugees, right? But the question then becomes like, what are we actually doing in the face of this here, right? Like what are our actual actions in the face of this? Because it's, it's one thing to feel, like what we're doing as Shakespeareans, right, is meaningful in the way that Shakespeare speaks to these issues here, right? He's listening to Ian McKellen, we think, yes, you know, this is kind of iconic Shakespearean actor, right, rendering these lines. And it's interesting, in, in one of those renditions, he alludes to the fact that, you know, uh, in the same square where that where that that speech is 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 given, right, in, in Sir Thomas More, uh, Nelson Mandela also, right, from the Africa House, stood on the balcony and you know, spoke to the people and said to them, like, I want to take you home in my pocket, right? And it's this kind of touching moment that he's he's you know drawing on directly before he goes into the rendition of the speech. But it's also a moment where he's asking his audience to think about Nelson Mandela as the would-be stranger in that situation here, right? And that's almost I I think belies the point of what I'm trying to get across through Shakespeare is questioning what is it that renders them strange here, right? And it is that whiteness. In other words, by drawing on Mandela, now his audience is comfortable saying like, oh, okay, there's one you know, situation here where we can think about and ultimately a, a feel good story about somebody who made it out of prison in South Africa. But on the other hand, right, what put him in that prison for 27 years? What kind of white supremacy? What kind of violence? And sometimes we, we ignore those facets. And certainly when taking out Shakespeare's hand, right, and, and thinking about that. Stephen O'Neill has a, a great essay on this, right, really kind of capitalizes on this. Um, but taking that out here, right, of context, what we, what we ignore then is all of the anti-immigrant sentiments that are within that play and that the play itself perpetuates. And if we're being honest, that Shakespeare often perpetuates himself through his works. And so I think in this way, it can be meaningful, like maybe not in the way that we often imagine it, but it can be meaningful in terms of allowing us to interrogate that violence. Um, so, okay, I'm gonna stop there and pose, I think, the final question here. Um, so here, this one is to uh, Jesus, Kate, and Adriana. So, as we think about the role of Shakespeare in the borderlands and the issue of race, language, and identity that attends to that presence, the question of decoloniality comes up often. So this last question uh, for the three of you. In your work, you discuss the ways in which indigenous and Chicanx artists appropriate and critique Shakespeare to decolonial ends. Can you talk a little bit about what this looks like? Can Shakespeare be decolonial? Who wants to start? <laughs> Uh, 
Oh, I'm not sure. Jesus, are you muted? Oh, I can go ahead while you- I was gonna say you go. <laughs> oh, okay, <laughs> sorry. Um, it's hard to answer these questions to three people. Um, okay, yes. So um, I guess our answer, and I think I can speak for the three of us here, is that the Shakespeare itself is not decolonial, but that indigenous and Chicanx artists are using often Shakespeare to decolonial ends. And I think um, Adriana and I have used the framework of Emma Pettis, who talks about the decolonial imaginary as, quote, a rupturing space, the alternative to that which is written in history, that time lag between the colonial and post-colonial, that interstitial space where differential politics and social dilemmas are negotiated. So while this work might not be decolonizing anything as in a final kind of like act, it is disrupting the coloniality of power and the epistemologies that uphold it. So I think that's how, what we're interested in is the ways in which these playwrights are, and young adult authors, I think in his sister's case, I'd love to hear you speak to that, are um, disrupting that work, using language to disrupt, using performance to disrupt, those, those kinds of things. If, if I can give one example, I think I was, um, you know, for time again. Uh, so I have two novels in front of me. Uh, I'll talk about Shame the Stars by Guadalupe Garcia McCall, who is a Texas, uh, grew up in Texas, uh, taught in San Antonio for a long time and so on. And that one's it's a very interesting text because uh, it's set in 1915 Texas. Uh, so right around, right around the time when the Rangers were basically uh, executing people. Uh, for lack of a better word, it was, it was lynching. And so part of my work now is on lynching studies and that, that poses its own problems. But um, the work actually is, is kind of interesting because it's Romeo and Juliet and uh, their whole, the whole point of the book, it moves toward uh, this kind of bringing attention to a history that has been occluded. I mean, uh, when, I, when I tell you that the Texas Rangers uh, murder people along the, uh, all over Texas actually, uh, during, between 1910, 1920, there was a lot of, uh, uh, a lot of murders, a lot of extra legal uh, killings and stuff like that. Most people are like, most people outside of the Texas uh, border, borderlands, would be surprised that the, the Texas Rangers, uh, whose name is on a baseball team, uh, films, TV shows, and stuff like that, they'd be very surprised. Same Texas Rangers, like exactly the same Texas Rangers. And so in that case, um, you see Romeo and Julia being deployed to basically bring attention to historical occlusion, so historical erasure, but also set the, re the, the record straight. And so my work on, on that piece is derangerizing derangerizing public public reading spaces. That is, uh, uh, if, as students go to, to class and have to read certain things uh, and are asked to read certain things, why not read something like uh, Shame the Stars, which would, would works really, really well, by the way, right next to uh, Romeo and Juliet, because it asks fundamental questions of like, how can young adults, how can young people be leaders? How can they, 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 they do things? I mean, if you really look at Romeo and Juliet, they, they actually, the heel, the heel of fracture. Uh, and uh, in some ways, I think the, the, the two characters, the two uh, characters in Shame the Stars do the same thing. So one of the things about decolonial, decolonialism, decoloniality is actually looking at the ways in which colonialism just erased, just whitewashed, just, just uh, things were forgotten, were, were not forgotten. They were, they were, they were, they were, uh, they were left out of curriculum. Uh, of curricula, uh, so that people would know it. Even people in Texas are, are hard pressed to to know about the uh, Texas Ranger atrocities uh, during the time period. The time period. So, like I said, so that would be an example, I think, uh, of decoloniality and uh, uh, just basically doing good work. I guess is what I say. Thank you both. Um, those are great answers to the question. I just wanted to add one thing to that. Um, when we were viewing the tragic corrido in far texas we overheard a conversation um, between the actors one of them said how's the audience mostly bolios and the other one said nah mostly raza so i think it's also important to think about like who is the audience for these plays who is coming to see them and what is the draw 
for audiences um, in community theaters or in metropolitan spaces. Um, so how are we questioning the universality of Shakespeare and Western knowledge itself through um, these performances? Thanks. Wonderful. I think we should switch now to some audience questions. We have some really wonderful questions from the audience. Um, so the first one I'm going to answer um, is from Henry Bell, and he says that he, he would love to hear an example of the linguistic phenomenon that Dr. Catherine Bomero Santos was talking about in the Measure for Measure production. And he mentions that there seems to be some crossover in other multilingual productions of Shakespeare around the world. So if you, uh, Dr. Santos or other panelists would like to kind of speak to this question of language specifically in these productions. Thank you so much for that question. Um, just to give you a brief example, and I think you're absolutely right that this is um, in many ways not unique to Borderlands Shakespeare and is drawing on um, larger histories of what we might call global Shakespeare. Um, and the role of translation in it. Um, so that, sorry, example I would give is from um, the scene in Measure for Measure where um, Claudio has been imprisoned. And what Masson does in that moment is he inserts an interpreter. Um, there is no interpreter in Shakespeare's version um, and this device isn't new, but what I, um, I think is so radical and disruptive in the way that Adriana is, um, pointing out in her in her last answer is that rather than his Spanish being a translation of Shakespeare's English, Shakespeare's English becomes a translation of his border Spanish in the moment of performance, right? So it's it's doing different things both on page and stage and inverting the direction of translation between Shakespeare and another non-English language. Does anyone else have any responses to the question of language? I know a lot of the texts that we're talking about are multilingual. We can also move on to another question from an audience member. We have one um, from Jasmine Lelick, who um, says that High, teaching high school Shakespeare is vast and influential, but it's also filled with the potential risk of perpetuating colonial ideals rather than undermining them, especially because the vast majority of high school teachers are white women like herself. Many teachers are not trained in anti-racist decolonial pedagogies and they often struggle with how to allow students to speak back to Shakespeare rather than simply letting Shakespeare speak for them. Um, so as we think about engaging in the public humanities, what kinds of collaborations can you imagine among scholars, theater practitioners, activists, and high school teachers to further this work and potentially minimize the pitfalls? If, if I can step into this question just a little bit, and uh, I, not, I, I don't think I can answer all of it as it's quite a, quite a daunting question, uh, but it speaks to uh, teacher training and uh, we, 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 uh, we talk to people uh, in, in education uh, about this quite a bit and, and how daunting it is to tell a, a undergraduate uh, here, take one class in Shakespeare, maybe, maybe two, uh, and then go out and teach it. And I think that's a daunting question. Um, I will say that, so in my field, because I use young adult literature and I'm kind of heavily invested in um, what young adults are reading, especially in the high schools and how uh, some of the text work is companion text and how some don't. Uh, I would say that uh, from my side of things, it's are you willing to allow uh, Shakespeare, uh, if he uses companion texts that are critiquing Shakespeare, uh, that are really bringing up really good questions about this, the, the, the questions of assimilation of, of different things like that, uh, of coloniality and decoloniality, uh, something like that, uh, that Shakespeare is going to be critiqued and is there are going to be large questions and sometimes if the whole point of it is fidelity to the text, then I don't know that these companion texts are doing that. Uh, I don't think they're, they're, they're not going to, they're not going to further your interest in Shakespeare without quotes, but they will further interest and educational interest in Shakespeare with quotes. And so uh, for teachers that are many of them who are not trained, I would say, yeah, I will, it's, it's a daunting task to retrain yourself, but at the same time, uh, a good literary binge is not, not a bad thing either. Just, just start reading uh, books. Uh, uh, just off the top of my head, I had wonderful, wonderful luck uh, teaching If You Come Softly uh, by Jacqueline Woodson. 
uh, Romeo and Juliet, uh, 20 years old and, and then speaking about uh, a young, uh, young black man who was uh, killed by the police. It's like, so it's 20, actually he's 23 years old now. Uh, so I'm like, but I have wonderful luck with, with that, but it will disrupt, disrupt Shakespeare. I mean, it will disrupt Shakespeare a lot. Uh, and if you can imagine what, what the learning environment will be where, where the two texts are, are, are colliding against each other, are grading against each other in the way that Ansel Dua asks us to think about, then if you can live with that, then, then you're gonna have a wonderful educational experience. If you want Shakespeare and then a text that explains Shakespeare, that's just something else. Wonderful. I have another question that might get at this a little. It's from Jyotna Singh. And she asked first a question um, for Ruben, which is when the Tempest was put in the curriculum for Chicanx studies, how was the play deployed? Um, did Shakespearean poetry address relevant issues? How did they decolonize the text? And then building off that the question for everyone, we all talk about using Shakespeare for making political interventions. Can you share with us some examples of how you used Shakespeare? Yeah, so I'll take the, the question aimed at me. I, I um, So from what I've gathered, the use of, of the Tempest was specifically to look at Caliban's resistance to the learning of language here, right? And, and so, uh, you know, I, I believe the high school teachers were using the Tempest in terms of thinking about these, these colonial paradigms here, right? And ways of resisting uh, and, and those conversations then were put, uh, you know, uh, on the table alongside uh, like pedagogy of the oppressed, for example, here, right, and letting students really think about what is it they were consuming and how they were consuming it. Uh, and so, you know, the the I, I don't I don't know the intricacies of the curricular design for the Mexican American Studies program, although it is available. And I will say this because of the efforts of an organization called the uh, 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 Libro Traficante, right, where they took all of the banned books uh, from that list and they began to promote them. Uh, across the United States, in fact, you're right. So through their efforts, in fact, the Mexican American Studies program that they outlawed in Tucson was adopted in so many other school districts because of the success. I mean, what, what often isn't discussed is, you know, the year after they dismantled that program, a study that came out of the University of Arizona proved that students who were in the Mexican American Studies program had higher graduation rates and high, higher college enrollment. And so their success was higher. Uh, and I, th I think a lot of that is through, through the works they're consuming. But in short here, this is why uh, they were using the Tempest. Uh, the reason they banned it is, is not really simply, you know, because it was on the list, but they were not allowed to teach anything where issues of race or colonialism could be broached. And so they had to self-censor across the board. And this did not mean that a teacher was presenting it, but even if a student said, wow, that Caliban seems to me a lot like a, you know, like a, you know, speaking to slavery here, right? Already then they are in violation of a law that was put in place. And it, so the teacher would be responsible for paying a fine upwards of $100,000. So anyway, that's that's where that, that grew out of, but I'll, I'll uh, allow others to, to weigh in on the second part of that question. Which was how can we, what, what ways are you using Shakespeare to make political interventions? I don't know that this is necessarily just me using Shakespeare, but um, I have taught one of the um, Nadko Macbeth productions that I write about, um, which I think is very aware of the kinds of storytelling I was describing where Macbeth is invoked repeatedly to um, talk about the power structures of the cartel. So it, it leans into that, but it uses that very same plot with, with some substantial changes to push back against that narrative and the kind of imperial intervention of, in this case, the, the US Marines across the border to restore order then ends up putting the US government in quite a critical light. Um, and so it's possible to kind of change the frame of of these really kind of mainstream narratives by using Shakespeare to kind of get people in the door um, and to, to kind of 
turn the tables, so to speak. So I do think that there is potential within these productions to, to use Shakespeare um, to, to resist, even when that very same play is being used in other arenas to um, perpetuate colonial ideologies and racism. Great, do we have time for one more question? Let's go for it quickly. I'm combining two, one's from Dolores Rodriguez and the other is from Lisa Jennings. And um, Dolores notes that some high school teachers are afraid to teach Shakespeare to BIPOC students um, because they're, they've been sort of um, led to believe that the students have difficulty understanding the language. And Lisa also mentions that she teaches some BIPOC students who are resistant to the idea of changing Shakespeare or appropriating it in these ways. So does anyone have any strategies for approaching these issues or also pushing back against this idea that Shakespeare is too hard for some students? I'm gonna step in really quickly to plug Ayanna Thompson and Laura Turchi's book, Teaching Shakespeare with a Purpose. I think if you are a high school educator, uh, it's a great resource and, and allows you to kind of think about uh, the on-ramp to these important conversations. Uh, in terms of strategies, I, I think something that's been mentioned here is you know teaching Shakespeare side by side here. I, I, I will also plug this book to the end of days. Arturo Islas says La Mali and the King of Tears because it's a Chicano author who is you know, writing about a Chicano in, in the high school education system, looking back, you know, he's a jazz musician in San Francisco. He's looking back at his experiences in the classroom with Shakespeare. Even if you don't teach that novel alongside Shakespeare, but take excerpts from it to have students think about the apprehensions of that linguistic identity when it comes to Shakespeare, I think would be important. And also equally as important is to remind students, you know, in particular BIPOC students that that, that sense of the alienation when it comes to Shakespeare is not only germane to their own experience. I don't think anybody comes at Shakespeare thinking like, I get it, like this is just, you know, easy. It's not easy for anyone, but then allowing them to talk about, you know, what are the other, aspects of, of their, their particular standpoints, right, that, that make it even more difficult or created in different, and this is, I think, as important, right, in, in, in different and, 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 and ways that, that have currency for their present moment and in their particular, you know, kind of area of the world. If I can just say one real one real quick thing, I would plug, um, let me make sure I got the names right. I would plug Ebony Thomas's and Amy Sorliano's um, article, it's called Restoring the Self. It talks about restoring uh, and uh, it's been used quite successfully by a lot of educators to get students to really think about uh, the language. Uh, let them play with language, let them write poetry. Uh, if they're having trouble uh, reading poetry, it's probably because they haven't been instructed on how to write poetry or for the matter how to read poetry either. Uh, so in, in that case, I would say, yeah, restoring would be a wonderful thing and let them just uh, write different scenes up, let them use their own language, let them use their own things. I think they would love that. So uh, I can put the the, uh, the link someplace, but yeah. Uh, so Ebony Thomas, uh, Amy Soriano, uh, Restoring the Self, wonderful resource. Wonderful. And I, there are a lot of questions um, in the Q&A box that we're not going to have time to get to, unfortunately, but please email us at borderlandshakespeare at gmail.com, or you can email any of us individually. Um, with questions. We'd be happy to share resources. We also do have a bibliography that we're planning to circulate, so we can um, share those resources with you all as well. All right. Uh, first off, thank you to the five of you for such a, an amazing conversation. I think I, I, I love when I'm always learning new stuff and, I, and this is just all fantastic for me. So again, thank you for taking the time today to talk with us. Uh, it was a pleasure. Um, to the audience, thank you so much for joining us. I know we had way, you know, way too many questions and not enough time to get to them all, but I'm glad to see such interest and very excited to hear that this work is going to be continuing moving forward. So um, with that, you know, thank you again uh, for everybody for joining us, and we hope to see you next month at uh, our next event upstream.